Ready. Hey. Just in the middle of the field, 45, 50. Green grass in front of him, leaving Lions in his way. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Oscar. What was it like playing for Coach Dicko? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. 61 yards. A Sunday stroll for Justin Fields. Oh, wow. And ta-da, and ta-da, and ta-da. Now, Bears Etc. with the voices of the Chicago Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thicke. From 1983 to 1992, the Bears won nine straight season openers, something five other teams have done in history, and something Kansas City can match tonight when they host the Detroit Lions. Tom Thayer started on all but two of those Bears teams, so his perspective keenly insightful as we kick off Bears, etc. Episode 14 in our first game preview of the 2023 season. Hi, everybody. It's Jeff Joniak with the aforementioned Tom Thayer. Coming out with the program, I sit down with fourth-year wide receiver Darnell Mooney as he comes back from a broken ankle and ready to resume where he left off as he continues to strive to be the best he can possibly be. A lot to cover as we break down the pack. We're going to do this every Thursday, Tom. We're going to do a preview uh, like we used to do on YouTube with the Bears uh, website. We're going to do a, a really deep dive on the Bears-Packers. But uh, winning the opener is imperative when it involves a division game. And on, on the mention of this, you you had a couple of days ago. It's America's game of the week, uh, so it's a national title. It's big, and, and the Bears, Tom, are eight and twelve in the last twenty years. Week one, two and seven over their last nine openers. I brought all this up because you didn't know any other way. You started in nineteen eighty five, and winning openers every year to nineteen ninety two. Was there a mindset associated with that, or were you guys just that good? No, you you had to earn it. If you go back and you look at the first two games in 1985, I think we are behind at halftime of both the games. And then finally, the third game of the year, when we went to Minnesota and Jim McMahon was inserted into the game and he threw a couple of touchdown passes as we were behind in the Minnesota Vikings game. I think that was the game that kind of put the belief in our minds that we could be a good football team and we could go out and challenge anybody because it was a difficult atmosphere to play inside what Dicka once named the roller dome in Minnesota. So it's something that the belief and the confidence comes with time. The bears aren't going to be as confident at the kickoff of the green Bay game as we hope they are in week five, six, seven down the line. However, they need to have a lot of belief in what they are able to accomplish in training camp, the development of certain players and segments of this football team that they can go out there and compete against anybody, especially week one of the NFL season. All right, I got a good one for you. Ready? This is all the stuff that comes out before week one. There's so much. It's a fresh slate. So everything that's pertinent uh, won't be in a few weeks. So you, you find out things, you learn things, people doing a deep dive. Name the last Green Bay quarterback to start against the Bears without Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers on the Packers roster. Well, I mean, not that Huntley kid. The last quarterback to start against the Bears without Favre or Rodgers on the Packers roster. Mike um, Tomzak uh, against Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, Mike wow. Tomzak, the, all, the all-time winningest Bears quarterback. He's, I know there's some <laughs> stats surrounding Tomzak. He started his career 10-0 and as a Bears starter. So yeah, but we forget. Uh, I forgot he was with the Packers. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Jim Morrissey, Steve McMichael, there are other Bears that went on to play for the Green Bay Packers. Jim McMahon. And, yeah, and, that you know, Jim McMahon was the one who took off his Green Bay jersey at the White House and exposed his Bear jersey because that's we hadn't gone to the uh, White House yet as a Super Bowl winning team. I, so I go to the L.A. Times. Headline, at least Harbaugh settles one score. This is 1991. 27 to 13, Bear quarterback gets the best of old foe Packers, Tom Zach, whose response is Jim who? Harbaugh buries the hatchet twice Sunday, once into the Packers by throwing two touchdowns and later with old teammate Mike Tom Zach. Quote, we shook hands after the game and I said, let's bury the hatchet, Harbaugh said, after the win. So you take it from there. Apparently bad blood between the two. Was that legit? Well, uh, Jeff, take this into consideration. Before the headset in the quarterback helmet, you either brought in plays with the position player, wide receiver, running back, whomever would tell the quarterback. Then there was a period of time that the 
quarterback coach, the offensive coordinator, or the backup quarterback would hand signal plays into the quarterback so they didn't have that exchange time. So the quarterbacks on the team, Jim Harbaugh, Jim McMahon, and Mike Tomczak, they go every day and they go through this practice session where they do the hand signals, as you can see me doing now, and that's how they relay the information in and out of the huddle from the sidelines. So a day before, a couple days before, we get, we're playing the San Diego Chargers in a preseason game. The Bears trade Jim McMahon to the San Diego Chargers. So now – it's such a quick trade that he's not going to play in the game. So Tom Zach is uh, on the sideline. Jim Harbaugh is in the huddle. Jim Harbaugh glances over at the bear sideline and he sees Mike Tom Zach signaling <laughs> the play that was just called over to Jim McMahon. But it wasn't something that Jim was standing next to the defensive coordinator because the time exchange would have not have worked anyways. It was just, kind of just some Tom foolery or okay. some Mike foolery, I should say from the sideline to McMahon, just to, you know, kind of extend the, the friendship that we all had together. Um, and Jim Harbaugh, the serious person that you see him today was equally as serious as a competitor and a quarterback back then. When he saw Tom's act to it, doing that, he took direct offense as Mike Tomzak was trying to derail Jim Harbaugh over to Jim McMahon. That wasn't the case. It was just a little hijinks inside the game itself. Yeah, so Tomzak said in this L.A. Times article, he didn't say anything to Harbaugh, and then added Jim who. Uh, but Harbaugh had a good day, 16-25, and 25, 209, 20 and 35-yard strikes to Wendell Davis and Brad Muster. Tomzak, 22 of 39, 215, and a touchdown to Jackie Harris. Uh, you guys were 10 and 4 at that point. And this is where, you know, the difference in, in eras is. You were closer to your seventh, which was called the Central Division title, the Black and Blue Division back in the day. Your seventh title in eight years. The Packers were 3 and 11 and had lost five in six games. Well, you're talking about a first round draft choice quarterback in Jim McMahon, who everybody wasn't, or excuse me, in Jim Harbaugh, everybody wasn't agreed upon that he should be the pick. You got a free agent quarterback in Mike Tomczak, who had a successful career with the Bears in the time he was there. Then you'd had an injury played quarterback and a former first rounder, Super Bowl quarterback in Jim McMahon that's getting traded for the first time. So there was a lot of, it wasn't bad blood, there was just a lot of competitiveness at that stage of the preseason and uh, Jim Harbaugh is chipping away at his his lengthy career in the NFL Mike Tomczak is trying to sustain his career in the NFL and Jim McMahon is trying to reinvent himself in his NFL career so um you know it's just it's something that happened and it was kind of a ugly situation in the locker room um, between the, the in the quarterback room and um, it you know kind of created a little bit of bad blood. Right. Well, and you were close to the quarter. You were close to all these guys. You still are. All of them. Yeah, but you know, at that point, I had a long uh, a, a long time friendship with Tom Zach, good buddy, business partner, and I liked Jim Harbaugh. I thought he was a great competitor. He was super intense, and whenever you get a first round quarterback out of the University of Michigan. Uh, then you know you'll you see you see what you can do. Jimmy Morrissey intercepted him in the game. Yeah, Jim Morrissey, uh, he had that interception. You know, Jim Morrissey had what was voted the number one interception in the history of Monday Night Football when we were playing the Minnesota Vikings. It was just an incredible play, and you know, Jim Morrissey probably doesn't get the NFL credit that he deserves, but he's a great guy and he was a great player. One last thing about that game. The 100th regular season win for Mike Ditka. Fastest coach at that point to 100 wins in the history of the NFL. He also had this to say about it because, obviously, you're going to ask Coach about it after the game. Uh, as for playing against Tom Zach, Ditka said, you don't play people, you've got to play the team. And the concept of what they're doing. He's a very capable young man. That was the quote. But that is true. You don't play the people, you play the team. 
Exactly. And it's the same thing, you know, getting ready for the Bears Packer game. And would you say it's the 207th meeting between the two teams? Mm -hmm. And it's not Justin against Jordan. It's the Packers against the Bears. Well, now it's the Justin and Jordan show. It's Justin Fields and Jordan Love. That'll be our focus. Uh, They're good friends. They share the same agent, Tommy. They've talked. I'm not certain they socialize, but they work out together at times. Um, so there's a, a, a young relationship, and it'd be a, a great story if these two uh, would now generate the next great rivalry in the division between great quarterbacks. I don't need another great quarterback in Green Bay, for example, but I, knew, I do need Justin to be great. Well, you know, they asked Justin Fields at the podium today about his relationship with Jordan Love because they did do a little traveling in the offseason. And he says they don't talk about strategy. They don't talk about football between the two teams. They talk about quarterback development and and other subjects like that. It's the same thing when my brother-in-law played for the Atlanta Falcons and the Bears were getting ready to play the Falcons. We didn't talk strategy. I didn't give him any hints or clues about our defense, just like he didn't give them to me so there's a certain sense of professionalism that you have to adhere to when you have those types of relationships and friendships yeah i would think it goes without saying Uh, john scully is the man he's referring to for those uh, young folks out there he is a a very good center (laughs) for the atlanta foul a guard center guard no jeff van note was the center right um of the old atlanta falcons and uh that's that's tommy's brother-in-law and he's a great guy super smart but uh you know, you're not giving away company secrets, and I'm sure you didn't ask him either, even in jest. Right. Listen, you know, I was playing on one of the most confident football teams in the history of the NFL, and he was playing on a struggling Atlanta Falcons team. So uh, there's no secret that I could give him that is going to change the outcome. I did root for him to stay healthy and play well, just like he did for me. And he had a couple of awful injuries throughout his career. And it's, those are the types of things that we have a great relationship and it's more relatable to talk about those types of things instead of, you know, strategy, just like we're talking about Justin and Jordan. Take a chance. Download the Bet Rivers app today. Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer on Bears, et cetera. So please, you've joined us. Uh, Jordan Love, Tommy's been in the league longer than Justin Fields. But Fields has 25 starts. Love has one. Mike Holmgren, the former Packers head coach, former Seattle head coach, was heard to say back in the day it took 32 starts to determine if a quarterback was the guy. That's been written about this week in in the Packer papers up there. That's where I got the quote. Uh, But I heard him say that in, in other instances as well, back at the Super Bowl when Seattle went to the Super Bowl years ago. Do you believe in that? No, go tell Justin Herbert that. Remember, Justin Herbert was in a backup role, and then the quarterback in front of him was getting a pain-killing injection, and they ended up doing something more destructive, and Justin Herbert was burst on the scene, and he's been great ever since. I think greatness is in the mind of a quarterback, and if it's Patrick Mahomes or Justin Herbert or Joe Burrow, or some of the other young guys, was Tom Brady's success predictable after Drew Bledsoe got hit on the sideline and he had to be inserted into the game? So um, you really never know it until you get your first opportunity to show it. All right, so if you're staring at the Bears' defense in a team meeting, uh, what are you telling them about Jordan Love? What to expect? Uh, control, you know, control is athleticism. Try to be as... Um, Uh, you know, a a variation of defensive fronts as you can possibly be. Try to make some adjustments throughout the cadence so they don't have time to make their own adjustments. And, um, you know, you have to – hopefully the crowd comes and it's a bear crowd and they, uh, you know, bring a noise that is almost – uncontrollable at the line of scrimmage. And once you take away the snap count and the volume of a snap count, the defense can be in charge of a lot of things. How do you anticipate Green Bay's defense handling Justin Fields? Will they try at all costs to keep him in that pocket and uh, avoid the damage he can do with his legs? That seems to be the popular thinking. And then make him pay for it, I guess, right? You know, Justin making the Packers pay. 
Right. You know, Justin's a unique uh, type of person to try to defense because you have to worry about the rush of the outside defenders. Try to if you want to keep him in the pocket, then you have to worry about what type of coverage you want to play against DJ Moore. But how does that factor in the rest of the receivers in the tight end? Can you contain a running game that was one of the tops in the league last year? So there's more concerns than just Justin Fields. And then if they try to, they're not going to ignore Justin because it's impossible. He's one of the most most dynamic athletes on the field. But I think that you, when you have a guy like DJ Moore, that's brought aboard, it kind of thing thins out their defensive responsibilities a little bit. Time for the status from hell. It's time. The first injury report of the season has come out. Uh, the bears today only did not have Dylan Cole, the reserve linebacker still working through a hamstring injury. He did not practice today. Uh, limited duty for Jaquan Brisker, Eddie Jackson on the back end, and Demarcus Walker. They got groin, ankle, and calf issues, respectively. Those doggone calf injuries, Tommy. Those are those are one. I mean, it has clearly lingered on Demarcus Walker. Hopefully, uh, he'll be back to full go. You know, Matt Eberflus was at the podium on Wednesday saying that uh, everybody was full go or was anticipated to be full go, but Cole did not practice on Wednesday. Uh, calves are particular. But then the groin and ankle for Brisker and Jackson are also something that the Packers will certainly circle and maybe test early in the game. Yeah, you know, those are questions that linger in us on our mind throughout all of training camp because they don't have to tell you what the injury is during training camp. So this is the first that we are alerted to those injuries. So maybe it's something that you pay attention to during the course of the game is a, a player favoring what their injury is designated to be. Is DeMarcus Walker dressed or not dressed? If he's not dressed, then obviously the cap is lingering. Is uh, the two defensive backs, are they struggling with their injuries that are designated to be? And, uh, can they last as long as they needed to in the conditions that I think are going to be perfect on Sunday? But to me, Jeff, I'm not, I don't always think about one game. I think about 17. And when you think about players that have fatigue type of injuries, I worry about Tampa week two. So if they're all ready to go and practice and they're considered a hundred percent, then they got to be a hundred percent in, in game time. Right now, when you spend over $2,999 at Steinhoffels, you'll score a $100 Bears Pro Shop gift card. Visit any one of the four Chicagoland locations, Vernon Hills, Crystal Lake, Downers Grove, and Harwood Heights, or shop online at steinhoffels.com. All right, the Packer Injury Report has three players not practicing and they're significant ones. It's a young receiving core. Everybody's two years or younger in the league, including Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson, both with hamstring injuries. David Bakhtiari, that's more rest. He's an 11-year veteran. He's played a lot of football, a cranky knee that has been problematic over the last couple of years. He'll be ready to go on Sunday at left tackle. Rashawn Gary, also in a similar situation coming off an ACL, limited today. That's a big boost to their pass rush, which soured at times last season without him. And Dontavious Wicks, a rookie wide receiver from Virginia, also dealing with a hamstring seal. Three receivers with soft tissues there in Green Bay. They had a much tougher camp, they say. They played them in the preseason. They wanted to look at things from a little different perspective because the Packers have been blown out their last two first weeks of the regular season. And so a little bit of a change by uh, head coach Matt LaFleur there. Uh, so things to watch on the Packer roster. My perspective, Tom, on all of this is with Jordan Love, the number one thing the Bears are going to have to shut down is something the Packers did well against the Bears last year, and that's run the football. And they've got a one-two punch. In my opinion, Aaron Jones is their top weapon and a most dangerous weapon because he can hurt you twice. He can hit you through the air, and he hits you running the football, much like Khalil Herbert they had over five yards of carry last year, each of them. They're not going to give them too much in the run game. They got A.J. Dillon for that. Uh, but they're, they're going to punish you a little bit and test that Bears front. What do you think? Well, you know, David Bottiari, he's missed a lot of football in the last couple of years due to injury. So, I mean, if you're resting a guy before the regular season on a day that's designated your first real practice, um, of, of the start of the regular season. I do have question marks about that. You know, veteran days off at this time of the year is never a good thing because you need that offensive line time to, to gel and get that chemistry, especially in front of a young quarterback. 
the hamstring issues with the talent that they have at the wide receiver position, especially when a guy like Watson puts speed on display uh, through the middle and the end of the season. So I would have to pay attention to the way those guys warm up. Do they really let it go in warm ups or are they are they a little bit hesitant? But you really brought up the key ingredient to this offense, and it is Aaron Jones, and it is because he can hit you in the ground and through the air. And the best thing a quarterback can have that's starting his first game under the circumstances of Soldier Field and the supportive crowd is having a running back that you feel equally as confident handing the ball off to as well as throwing screens and short little passes so you got to make the atmosphere really uncomfortable for Jordan Love. And that is the way that you're really going to derail the tempo uh, of, of the Green Bay offense that we've seen in the last 30 years. Tom, young quarterbacks turn the ball over. It happens. It's always happened. It happened with Aaron Rodgers, 13 interceptions in his uh, first season. Peyton Manning, of course, led the league in interceptions. Interceptions torment young quarterbacks. If that's the case, Bears defense, get ready. Then force them. Make them. Get the turnovers. Intercept the ball because it, it, it might be there for the taking. And it's a young secondary, obviously, with young talent. Jalen Johnson's not young anymore, though. He's the leader in, in that group at corner. But Connor Gordon, Tyreek Stevenson, the rookie, whomever's playing out there, be hunting for the football. Look for those tip passes. Position yourself in the right way to be there for those lucky bounces so they're not so much lucky and they're there because the strategy said so. You know, one thing uh, oh, going into this game, I think the the multiple defense, defenders they have at the defensive line could be the biggest asset to the Bears' defensive backs because if they can rotate a fresh group of guys in there that are getting pressure and making the, the, the pocket uncomfortable for Jordan Love, if he's looking to escape before he gets to his final drop step or he doesn't have a chance to go through his reads and he's kind of stuck in, on one receiver, then, yeah, maybe there's a defensive back that can take advantage of that. Eddie Jackson and Jaquan Brisker are going to have to read immediately. And then Jalen Johnson, Tariq Stevenson, Kyler Gordon, if they have an opportunity to get in front of one of those passes, they're going to have to take advantage of it. But they're not going to do it single-handedly. And I think the middle of the defense with Tremaine Edmonds is going to be you know, m- more clogged because of his ability, his length, and his uh his way to challenge and coverage is, but they got a couple of young tight ends that can really help a young quarterback get the ball out of his hands immediately. Yeah, well, there's um, there's a lot there. There's a lot of speed right now. They got it at uh, the receiver position. They got it at the tight end position for sure. Uh, but in an offensive line, it's a veteran offensive line. All right, let's flip it. And before we do, we should tell you Miller Lite is the official beer of the Chicago Bears. Tastes like Miller time, Chicago. All right, so... Let's talk about the Bears receivers against this secondary. It's a secondary that's been uh, maligned at times, especially at safety. Uh, But the corners, including Jair Alexander, is one of the best. The Bears match up with D.J. Moore, and Jair Alexander should be a beauty. Uh, That's probably one you've got circled, I'm sure. Uh, How would you stack uh, what the Bears have brought in with Claypool, Moore, a healthy Mooney, Komet, Tunyon, the addition of Mercedes Lewis, who won't be heavily involved, obviously, in the passing game, but all these weapons against that secondary. Well, you know, you, you kind of think back to the days when Deion Sanders played for the Dallas Cowboys and they played the San Francisco 49ers. So Deion's job was to go out there and take Jerry Rice out of the offense. And then it opened up John Taylor and the tight ends and, and Roger Craig and the rest of the players that – the quarterbacks could throw the ball to. So if Jair Alexander does follow DJ Moore all around the field, all those other guys you mentioned are going to have to be open targets for Justin Fields. And I think Chase Claypool with his size, he can. I think Darnell Mooney with his route running, he has that ability. I, I do think that the tight end position for the Bears, if you look at the combination of Cole and Tanyan, and, you know, one thing we're going to have to be introduced to this year because we don't know a lot about it is the pass catching ability of the running backs. And so when you look at, you know, Jair, Jair Alexander, who he's going to take away, 
the others, the other guys have to present themselves as, as open targets to Justin as quickly as possible. Let's find out exactly what the Bears are thinking these days, including Darnell Mooney as he returns from a broken ankle last season. He had tightrope surgery. It was an eight-month recovery. He's back. He's ready to roll. I, I want to start on the Packers because it's what everybody's been hoping for and, t- and thinking about. So let, let's just dive right in before we just chat a little bit. It feels like it's bigger than one game. I know you guys can't look at it that way, but there's just something about it. Symbolic. Um, you don't play them again until week 18. Yeah. When that that theoretically may not even matter, right? <laughs> you, guys, you guys could ever be locked up, playoff spot. Sure. You know, stuff like that happens. This, this thing just carries a lot of weight for a lot of people. What's a player perspective? What's Darnell's perspective? Uh, I mean, I've never beaten the, these guys since I've been in the league, so... Uh, it's definitely a big one, and you you understand the the rivalry uh, many years after you play multiple games, and um, it's definitely a big one. First game of the year for sure, and then going against them, it's it's something that the fans care about. So you you kind of gravitate and understand like why they care about it so much, and then you're just like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's <laughs> definitely beat those guys for sure. So didn't you have a team even in, in youth football <laughs> yeah. or any sport you played? You just got tired. Exactly. Like, you want to beat them. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, for sure. Are you at that point now? Yeah, definitely. Definitely yeah. want to beat them for sure. For sure. I mean, whatever we got to do to beat those guys for sure. I'm ready to pull out everything that we have just to take care of these guys for sure. You know, I went back and looked, and I, I know what the numbers say, okay? It has mm-hmm. been a struggle. Mm-hmm. Way before you ever got here, 30 years of it. Kenny Clark, for example, was 13-0 and against the Bears. Uh, Preston Smith's ten and zero. Matt Lafleur's eight and zero. It, it's just, yeah. it it just hasn't happened. Yeah. So it's it's, it's time for change. <laughs> when the bully on the block, exactly. you got to finally punch exactly. him in the mouth, right? Exactly. Otherwise, anyway, uh, this is big for you. I know it's big because <clears throat> coming off injury is a lonely ride. I know you and I spoke months ago, and you said you're glad you went through the experience, sure. not in getting injured, but yeah, just what you learned. Can you? Put that in the context for the average. Per- Why? Um, it's just uh, you you get a lot to like um, self reflect. I mean, and just have a lot of self awareness. I mean, it's just you, a lot of rest time, and I mean, you you get to read some books and just have um, a lot of alone time. You're looking at the ceiling a lot of times, and you're just relaxing and just um, thinking, thinking a lot. And sometimes thinking, overthinking can be a bad thing, but sometimes it can be a good thing, you know. So. Um, uh, it's been what eight nine months since the last time I was actually in a in a game or whatever. So um, I'm excited to get back out there. It won't be any like um, fearness or anything. I mean, obviously the preseason was nice. I didn't get the actual feeling, but I definitely will allow myself to have some emotion going into this game. And um, in what sense? Just uh, readiness and just ready to you know get back to being me and. Um, Going out there, what, what I wanted to do uh, last year, I didn't get to do as much, but um, uh, just pick up, pick pick back off of where I, I feel that um, you know, I'm able to perform at, and um, it's easy to do that with a, a second year in, into the offense, and just everybody is is not so much of a newness thing; it's more of a, a like we know what's going on. So uh, I'm happy to get back for sure. Is it an offense? I mean, just think about you. Can't remember how many targets. Well over a hundred a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Is this gonna be an offense now where you just gotta find your place? Mm-hmm. For sure. You mean like role wise? Role wise, but that's day to day. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Day to day. Like it, it, you, I don't think this is an offense, and you correct me if I'm wrong. If, hey, hey, Darnell, listen, and um here's the pecking order. Mm-hmm. This is how it's gonna go. So, you know, don't be anticipating a lot. Yeah. Or hey Darnell. You're going to be the feature. No. Day to day, week to week. No, for depends sure. the matchups. For sure. It definitely, or, yeah, right? What Justin on, sees. Yeah, it definitely matters on all those occasions. Yeah. Like, it's, you never know. You can be the, the, the top guy for this game, and you cannot be the top guy for the next game. So it just just depends on who we're playing. And um, just matters about matchups, like you said. So we'll we'll see. Um, it's it's big for the first couple of games, honestly, to, to identify who we are and what we like to do. So. See, I already think that. Yeah. We, we, we love to run the ball, and we're good at it. Mm-hmm. Justin's a dynamic runner. Yep. We know all that already. Got the weapon reason increased. The offensive line's different. Yep. Hopefully they'll be healthy. Sure. Um, 
I don't know. To me, there's not too many surprises. Yeah. I mean, it all looks it all looks good. <laughs> It just it just has to be put out there and performed. So, I mean, you can, you know, throughout the whole off season, you have all the hypeness of everything, yeah. and just like, yeah, we're gonna be able to do this, but you don't really know until you actually go out there and play, or how they're gonna play you. Exactly. Because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking they're gonna play less man. Mm -hmm. They don't want their back turned to Justin, yeah. don't you think? For sure. You never, yeah, yeah you never want to do that. That's a, just a dangerous thing. You, Obviously, he showed you don't do that at all last year. So, yeah, um, yeah, we'll see. You never, you have, you can have some guys that are just like we don't care who you are. We're gonna right. do this. So, you never know. that is gonna happen. You never know how they how people are going to play us. So, post injury, mm -hmm. it's always an interesting discussion because, and you said you were gonna have ankle yep. uh, surgery of some kind, no matter what happened, and you happen to have a broken ankle. Mm -hmm. First of all, how painful was it? Um, when I first the injury, injured, yep. um, at first I like on the field wise, like I knew I broke it. Yeah. Um, cause Byron was telling me like, get up. I'm like, nah, bro, this is, this is broken. It's like, no, there's no way that I'm getting up after this. And, uh, I'm usually like, I'll get up and go to the sideline or whatever. And then shake, shake it off. Up, yeah. And then come <laughs> back in. But this one, I, I knew even going to the locker room. Uh, Andre and then we're trying to like get me on the stretcher. I'm like, that's one thing I'm not doing. I'm walk. I'm going to walk off of this field, but I'm not getting on that stretcher. You better give me your shoulder. That's the only way I'm getting off the field. So, um, I mean, it was a, it wasn't painful then, but then when I like yeah. died down, uh, it got a little painful. And then I got in my car after the plane ride, all that, all that air or whatever, and um, kind of blew my blew my ankle up a little bit. But yeah. um, it was a little painful. It wasn't too crazy, but it was it was painful. Do you feel whole again? Yeah, I mean, I felt felt whole. Yeah, with, within it all. I mean, I made a decision when I was in after surgery that this is something I, I really want to do. So I'm going to continue to pursue what I want and get out of what I want out of this. And um, I made that decision then, and I'm not looking back. You look amazing. Thank you. Right, you're 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 strong. What do you think that'll do for you? Have you have you felt that strength that you've added, that muscle, that armor? Have you felt it when you've gone up against DBs, even in practice? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I can I can use my strength uh, more, whether it be like uh, a sneaky push off or just blocking wise and um, running my routes and not getting uh, bumped off of anything and um, just just playing some uh, just having some good play strength. Uh, I would say like DJ man, DJ has incredible play strength. Like he can catch the ball over anybody at any point of time and it's just amazing to see that because it's like that's what I want to be able to do every time like no matter what happens the balls in the air it's mine and DJ does a good thing good a good act of that and I want to do that same action of that as well you mentioned you, you read a lot of books mm -hmm. during your time rehabbing and and getting ready what would you read and anything that's sticking with you to this minute um, unstoppable it's by uh, Tim Grover Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we all know Timmy. Yeah, man, he's a Chicago Bulls he's fame. Amazing, amazing. I've person. known him forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's the gist of that book? Uh, it's about it's basically about finding your role and understanding understanding your role and and playing that role into the into the like the um, the best you can and uh, understanding and really going fulfilled about it. So, um, yeah, that was a good book. I, I kind of read it over and over to um, remember myself on what. What sure. I want to do. Well, listen, like you said a long time, you're all about heart, right? Yeah, for sure. That's going to carry. That's going to win the day for Darnell Mooney. <laughs> Have a great season. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Let's go get him. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got to love the optimism and the desire to be great continues to be there for Darnell Mooney. Uh, you heard in this interview, Tom, just how much he wants it, how much he loves it, and how much he's back mentally. He's not, he's not, he says he's not scared about going out there. There's no fear about going out there after that surgery and, and actually playing a real football game. And that, that's really the first step in recovering from an injury. Oh, no doubt about it. I remember after I had back surgery, I needed to hit somebody and I needed to hit somebody hard. And that was going to give me all the confidence that I needed to go forward. I've always loved Darnell Mooney. He's got incredible work ethic. He has great desire. He wants to be great, which I think is the most important uh, aspect a player can have in their development. He's still a young kid. So if he can come up and he can be that great second option to DJ Moore and Chase Claypool and the rest of the guys, 
Justin Fields should continue to develop that relationship that he started with him last year. So I pull for Darnell Mooney, and I hope that he continues on that trajectory that he has since the moment he's got here. Total team guy, and he's very close with Justin Fields. They have carved out quite the relationship. Uh, They still work at it after practice every day, sometimes for 45 minutes, extra (laughs) throws. He puts in his work on his jugs gun at home, and uh, he is really, really in fantastic shape right now. He says that uh, that build he's got right now, that he's all he looks like a. I'm telling you, man, he's <laughs> thickened. He thickened up, man. He's strong. He said it's it's helped him. He feels it against a corner. He can use better strength, certainly in blocking as well, and so that'll serve him well. But you know, I can't have a, a, a preview without mentioning Cole Komet. I, I I purposely didn't put him in the group of weapons that are at the uh, uh, are at, at the ready for Justin Fields because. He came on strong when Justin came on strong last year, Tommy. The numbers say so. Caught six of his seven touchdowns down the stretch, the whole bit. But week two last year, that first game when Justin was 7 of 11, no targets to Cole Komet. Not one. And with the suspect safety play there at Green Bay right now that they're still not convinced, and even though Savage is a good player and a former first-round pick, um, I'd rather see a 6 catch 72 yard 12 yard a catch average that he had in week 13 so i've got him circled for a big day on sunday what's your thought all right i would rather start with 170 yards rushing because cole is blocking the edge so well that the the outside zone is opening up in khalil herbert and the rest of the running backs that are on the field and getting their opportunities are having huge yards because if that's the case, then Cole is going to open up opportunities for himself because they're going to become more aware of him being a great blocker and they're going to have a less of a defender on him. And then he's going to be able to run away from that defender and you're probably going to have a larger attachment than 12 yards of catch. So Cole, the blocker is going to help Cole, the receiver. Good news, Chicago United Airlines is getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat, and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears, and you too. Jeff and Tom on Bears, etc. All right, I left the uh, the most difficult part of this conversation <laughs> until the end in breaking down the Packers, and, and that is their defensive their, their defensive line, Tommy. We, we know what Kenny Clark's all about. They got a healthy Rashawn Gary now. Uh, that will boost their pass rush. He is a great kid. He works at it. He also wants to be something special, and uh, he's back, and it looks like he's ready to roll. So with Preston Smith on the other side, they've got young guys. They can have a rotation up front now, too. Devontae Wyatt in his second year didn't get as much playing time a year ago because there were veterans in front of him. No veterans in front of him now. So this top pick, a first-round pick, and that, that defense has eight of them, along with a f- – linebacking core that uh, includes Quay Walker in his second year. Again, everybody assumes you're going to take a step after your first year. He led that team in tackles, and he's very fast on the perimeter. Can the Bears' offensive line handle that defensive front? Oh, they have to. It's not a question. If you're go, if, if your question mark going into the game is, can the Bears' offensive line handle the defensive line of Green Bay? then you, you're already behind. You have to make sure that you have a great deal of confidence in your double-team combination blocks. When you have a combination block that starts with the double-team at the line of scrimmage then goes up to the second level, make sure that you get the line of scrimmage block first. And that's going to increase the opportunities in the yards for your running backs. Devondre Campbell is a heck of a middle linebacker. They got a 340-pound nose guard. So those are the types of guys that are going to be have to be moved out of the way in order for the Bears running game to flourish like it did last season. And if it does, the, the movability of Justin Fields is going to create more opening up, more open opportunities for him to get outside the pocket and work the edges on screens. And, and like the first play of the preseason this year, a nice, comfortable, easy pass to Kari Blassing game. We need to see a couple of those just to keep them off balance. All right, Tom, uh, we're on Zoom for you folks at home, so that's how we communicate. So uh, do you see my little my spotter chart? Yeah. That is uh, the spotter chart from Week 13, Bears-Packers. And look at how many players are only left on that chart. Those were the guys active on that day. Do you see all the spaces? 
on the Bears, and frankly, yeah. quite a few on the Packers. It's, I mean, it is a frankly a brand new team. Let me count it up: two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two players. So that you're telling me that on a game, so half the team is going to be different on the field on Sunday for the Bears. Okay, Jeff, save that sheet, save the save your flip chart from the week one, and let's look at it on week eighteen because yeah. that's the next time that these two teams will face each other, and let's look at the differences in names. Let's look at the guys that have played uh, all sixteen games up until that point, and let's see the difference because. The team with the most names on week 18 that was in week one is going to have the better record and the team most likely fighting for a playoff spot. Mm, great thought right there. Uh, let's touch on special teams. Uh, Bayless Jones will return kicks. Trent Taylor will be the punt returner. The Bears have their operation the same. We got Cairo Santos off a good preseason. But it's totally different in Green Bay, Tommy. Totally different. They got a whole new operation. What are the inherent challenges coming to Soldier Field? And granted, it's going to be a beautiful day. I don't know what the wind's going to be, but we're talking about guys that have never been there. Anders Carlson will be the kicker. He had a 57-yarder in the preseason for the Packers, but he's the new kicker. Mason Crosby is still a free agent out there. And Carlson in his career in college was just 5 of 17, 50-plus. So I don't know how much faith they have in him for that. The new punter is Daniel Whelan, big leg, but he beat out Patrick O'Donnell, a 10-year veteran, and a brand-new long snapper in Matt Orzik. For me, the key is is Whelan because he hasn't been a holder very much in his career. Pat O'Donnell was exceptional as a holder, exceptional. These little things make a difference in week one. I'm looking at even minor things like a field goal hold making a difference in this game. Listen, if I was Cairo Santos, I would go seek out the kicker and the holder, and I would tell him how difficult it is to kick in Soldier Field, how the ground is uneven, and you never know if you're going to have a great ball placement on a, a center holder exchange. And I would plant a seed in their head because <laughs> I, I guarantee you, it's not. this is not going to be the first time he hears about the difficulties in kicking in Soldier Field. They're going to come out there early. They're going to look up at the sky box. They're going to figure out which way the flags are blowing. They're going to go through all this, you know, pre-weather look, and and that's going to the other going to think about it every time they hit the field. So Cairo, he is the most uh, experienced guy of, of this group of guys that are going to go out and be part of the special teams on Sunday. So, you know, if we talk about giving no advice from Jordan and Justin. Don't yeah. give any advice <laughs> to the opponent kicker. Yeah. I'm sure they chatted up pretty good. Kickers take care of themselves now, uh, of each other, I should say. Hey, we're brought to you by PNC, official Bank of the Bears. Any final thoughts, uh, concerns, otherwise, about this matchup? Uh, you know, I, I just, I'm excited. I wish it was a noon start because I would like to get to it faster than 325. And I'm so excited to see what Justin Fields is in year two in the Luke Getze system. What does Luke Getze remember about the defense of the Green Bay Packers? Where does he feel that Justin is the most confident player going to the line of scrimmage after the play called in the huddle? And I know that's selfishly only looking at one position, and I know the defense plays an important role, but when you have a quarterback that's been in the MVP conversation all offseason, I want to see if that starts game one. All right, Tom, hope you're not going to be late. Uh, we'll be there. And uh, by the way, we'll be on tonight on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 at uh, 6 o'clock. And our special guest, Chris Berman from ESPN Legendary Status, he'll join us as well. That'll do it for us. Bears Weekly, Thursday night. And our podcast will wrap things up on Monday. We'll have head coach Matt Eberflus and Tom and I will break down uh, what we hope will be a Bears win to stop an eight-game losing streak to Matt LaFleur and the Green Bay Packers on Monday morning. Thanks for listening, everybody. Vizzy Hard Seltzer, the official hard seltzer of the Chicago Bears. Thank you, Molson Course, for your sponsorship. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Please subscribe now to the Chicago Bears official app, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down, everybody. We'll see you Sunday at Soldier Field.